Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vidudalai Rashid Kandrajina, uh, and I'm a senior research fellow from Singapore Center for Environmental Life Sciences Engineering at the Nanyang Technical University. So, um, in this talk today, um, I'm going to, um, you know, talk about pathogen emergence. So, within the theme of environmental monitoring, and uh, so this is an important, uh, you know, field uh, that everyone should have knowledge about. I think. And uh, especially during this COVID time, uh, we should understand like, you know, what is the uh, evolutionary dynamics that is going on uh, between microorganisms and also how that actually affect, um, you know, the uh, emergence of new uh, phenotypes and uh, new variants or whatever it is uh, that can be detrimental for uh, animal or human health, yeah. So that's the uh, that's the um, place that I want to start with. So just to, to give you a, a brief uh, glimpse of like you know, what we are uh, looking at, uh, when you talk about ecosystems, uh, since you you guys are from you know most of you are from zoology background, and me too, <clears throat> I did my bachelor's in zoology and then moved slowly towards microbiology, uh, and uh, you know when it comes to ecology ecosystem. <clears throat> species interact all the time, right? So these interactions can be, uh, you know, I broadly classified into two, which is like one set of uh, uh, interaction can be set as cooperation, the other one is conflict. But then when you take a community, which is composed of a lot of different organisms, uh, different species and from different, you know, uh, kingdom or whatever it is, um, there is a fine balance that's going on between them. So everything actually coexists together and then evolve together, right? And if you go in detail, you can see that all these organisms do have uh, both cooperative and conflicting interactions, right? So, um, so there, there are multiple examples. And, uh, and uh, one, um, one thing you can talk about is like, you know, uh, prey predator interactions, like, you know, that is mostly conflict interaction, but then uh, there are other kinds of interactions like, you know, social uh, co sharing common goods between uh, organisms. Um, so the same thing is actually happening in the microbiology as well, not from microbiology, but microbes as well uh, in the real life, like, you know, microbes that are present all over us, all around us, uh, all over us, in fact, uh, and within us, they do have these conflict and cooperation going between each other as well as between us and them, right? So the fine balance is really important and we need to understand what is driving this. Uh, they, and then that's how we will be able to understand, you know, how these new pathogens, uh, for example, uh, are emerging, right? Uh, for example, uh, I, I have a talk here, uh, another talk uh, on, on skin microbiome. Right, so microbiome is actually a collection of microorganisms in a system. For example, human microbiome is like the microbes that is living inside us or on, on us, right? So these are called microbiome. Generally, this microbiome, uh, for example, uh, or the microbes uh, on us, uh, we are staying healthy, right? So despite all these microorganisms can cause infection, but we are staying healthy. So there is a, there is a balance going between them. But at some times, it can also happen that there is something called dysbiosis happens. So, so this dysbiosis is uh, is um, uh, is a is a condition where a normal balanced system goes disarray, right? So the microbial composition or the relative abundance of uh, you know good to bad species actually changes, and that actually can be associated with sickness and illnesses and so on. And this dysbiosis, we need to understand uh, uh, in, in the context of uh, ecosystem dynamics, because um, there are species that are actually doing good to us. And because of the environmental factors or triggers from our own system or whatever, maybe it's our food or whatever, and that can actually affect the dynamics between the organisms. And that's how a new strain probably emerges over time as part of its own evolution. And that kind of, you know, becomes infectious. So it's really important to understand this. And you, so in the, in the, in the context of cooperation, you want to understand like what are the key strong interactions? Like what are the key species and how do they, you know, uh, how do they uh, shape the whole function of the community? 
because these key species and the key interactions are very, very important that they basically takes care of the system, right? Even though there are many organisms coming and going, there are transient things that are happening. Uh, and these are, these are the key things um, that are governing the whole uh, system. And the second thing is actually, when we are studying this, we need to also understand that, you know, there are uh, these key species that can also emerge into a pathogen because of certain trigger. And if we, if we are able to understand that triggers one, or if we are able to see uh, upfront, like, you know, monitor, uh, like, you know, if these are things that are happening within the system, then we will be able to protect, um, protect the system as well as uh, prevent these pathogen emergence from happening, right? So the, this is a, a brief uh, outlook on, on this thing. So when, when studying this, there are a couple of ways to study this, right? So either you can actually go into the environment, understand what is happening, or uh, you actually do it in the lab. One thing uh, is good about the microbes is that you can actually do it in the lab. And because uh, all these interactions and uh, you know all these uh, ecosystem dynamics, is, it's pretty common for microbes as well as uh, macroorganisms. Like if you, if you, a lot of microorganism, microbial ecology is actually, um, uh, is actually being uh, enriched by the knowledge that we already have from, let's say, forest ecology, right? So it, this is a microbial forest that we are looking into. So it's easy to study them and develop them and study them in the lab. So we generally go for laboratory models. So for example, uh, so this is a system where uh, the, the top one, the top two, so these are actually uh, the organisms that are present on our skin. And these two are really important. And the there is a very closely knitted dynamics that is going in between them. They, they cooperate with each other. And at the same time, if something goes wrong, they also compete with each other, right? So this is one system. Uh, and uh, the, the another system is actually uh, uh, a system where you have a Vibrio versus a Tetramina. It's a protist. Uh, it's a protozoa. So it's bacteria protozoa interactions. It's, all, it's going on all the time. And uh, this is, so the, the top one is actually a cooperative interaction. We know it is a cooperative interaction. At times they do turn into co uh, conflict, but most of the time it is cooperative. Uh, but here in this case, they are competitive interactions uh, because uh, Vibrio vulnificus, for example, is a, a prey for the protozoa here, the tetramina. So this amoeba is able to ingest this organism, so it's its food and uh, Typically, a uh, prey predator interaction goes on them, and this is a very, um, you know, uh, very strong force uh, in evolutionary um, in, in evolution. Actually, so before I go uh, deeper into this, uh, I want to acknowledge that you know the the, the work was uh, carried out both in um, Singapore in our center, CELC, and also in I three Institute Sydney, and these are people involved in this study, right? Um, Okay, so as I said, like you know, predation is a very strong force, right, in the in the eco in in the ecosystem evolution, uh, because um, so this can be explained by theory as well. So this Lotka-Volterra predation prey model, where you can see that the red line is a predator and the prey is the blue line. So what happens is if the predator population rises, the prey population actually, when when the predation population is at the peak, the prey population actually goes down. At the same time, when the prey population goes down, after uh, after a certain point of time, the predator population also goes down because it doesn't have the prey to eat, right? So this population goes down. And now, since the predator population goes down, the prey population starts going up. And so is the predator. So it's, it's actually a cycle that is happening. So what's very important is that in this cycle, because there is a pressure for survival, what happens is there are new things that emerges. So basically this can be explained as arms race. For example, if you think about a cheetah and a deer, they, they both compete with each other in speed, right? This, the faster uh, 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 deer can go, uh, the, uh, the chances are that it can survive, right? But again, the cheetah, the next generation cheetah has to run faster than the peers, uh, the deer, so that it can actually catch its prey. So there is an arms race going on between 
a lot of different uh, pairs of interactions, these conflict interactions. So one of so one this cartoon actually explains the relationship between uh, two different organisms that are, uh, let's say, microorganism, right? I, I, I mean, the, the, yeah. So this looks like a coronavirus, but yeah, let's say this. So let's say this coronavirus is able to at, at, attach to this particular organism and able to cause infection. So what happens is because of this arms race, it is actually developing different kind of receptors on, on its surface so that they cannot actually attach. Now, this has to evolve. So then it evolves so that it can attach to this one, then it actually evolves back. So this happens all the time, right? So most of the time this pressure happens in this area where there is, um, where this population uh, has a stress, is going under stress. So while this arms race is happening, sometimes what happens is when it is developing new variants or new uh, ability to, uh, you know, or new traits, it happens to cross infect, right? So this is kind of, this was actually developed for this organism in competition with this, this organism, but it happens to be infecting a mammalian cell. So that's typically what happened in the corona or, you know, the Nipah virus that we, we saw like a few years ago in Kerala. And this has been going on for a long time. So zoonotic infections actually have actually is actually caused by but these kind of things. So there is an interaction going on between the animal and its own virus or bacteria. And because of the arms race that's going on for a long time, sometimes it, 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 it happens to have a mutation or a developed a new trait that actually can affect, let's say humans, right? So this is how it works. So for this reason, it is really important that you know we need to monitor uh, these organisms. So uh, the the actually the aim of this study that I'm presenting today is to understand uh, what kind of modifications or what kind of new things that the Vibrio valinificus can uh, develop uh, when it is in conflict with the predator Tetramina. So the reason because the reason we chose this organism is that Vibrio, of course, it is very close to Vibrio cholerae. Uh, which causes cholera, and the Vibrio actually is actually, uh, so I, I, another important thing is that the Vibrio valinificus is able to cause uh, infections to humans. Uh, so most of the time it is opportunistic where it, it can cause sepsis wound infection, and actually within the Vibrio clade, this has a really high mortality rate. So sometimes people, when, when, uh, especially when there are floods and so on, when, uh, and these organisms, uh, floods from the marine estuarine environment, right? So these organisms can persist there and they can actually infect humans. So we wanted to understand like if there are some kind of, uh, you know, this evolutionary uh, arms race going between these two organisms that can actually um, lead into uh, infection. So one thing about the tetramina is that these are actually organisms that are that have um, that have the ability to uh, interact with the prey, which is actually evolutionarily conserved, similar to what our macrophages can do. That's why we are interested in this. So if this organism can evade the infection of this one, evade the uh, predation of this one, that means this can also evade our uh, macrophages. So that's part of our immune system, right? So that's why this pair is really important that we are studying now. So I'm going to just give you a few examples of, you know, what kind of defenses that these bacteria has uh, developed or, against their um, against their predators, right? So there are two ways that they, they can uh, prevent. One is actually uh, during uh, th that you know they can they can modify themselves that they cannot actually predate them, or once they go into the cells, they can actually secrete something like like a toxin or something and then kill the cells from inside, right? So these are the two places where they can do. So before ingestion, for example, if you take they can grow longer so that they cannot actually engulf them, and or they are really fast in moving so they cannot really compete with them or they kind of change its surface structure so it cannot bind to them or recognized by the predator, or they actually accumulate and form biofilm-like phenotypes uh, that again, it's also a size thing that it cannot actually interact with them, or they also produce toxins that it can, you know, um, it can uh, kill the cells. And after ingestion, actually, if you, if you think about it if, you would, if it goes inside, either they just produce some toxins that it will kill the cells from inside, or they grow inside, 
become big and then the cell thinks that okay there is something that is not good for it is inside the cell so it will just split it out so uh, recently uh, you know our collaborator in this one uh, from sydney they have published that vibrio uh, uh, one of the vibrio cholerae is also doing this where when it is spit out then they become more infections infectious right so this was also was discovered so the important thing is that evolutionarily speaking these two kind of interactions right so they are actually uh, kind of uh, you know associated with the origin of extracellular and intracellular pathogenesis right so pathogenesis as in humans or animals so that's why we want to study this so we wanted to find out if there are novel predator defense strategies that are developed by this organism so what we basically did was we grew this organism together so we isolated like 13 different uh, strains of this particular vibrio valinificus and then we incubated this together with uh, uh, with this organism and over time what we did was we actually quantified the cells uh, before incubation and after incubation so what happens is if the cell is not able to uh, you know resist predation so the cell the number of cells from initial time which is in the white bar will be different which is like very small amount i mean it will be reduced uh, as in the gray bar or after 24 hours right so you can see that all of them are done so except for this particular uh, organism which is env1 this is the strain where the the amount that was present initially is equal to the amount that was present after the intubation so which means the uh, amoeba is unable to graze them. So we found that there is something going on here. Maybe this particular organism has developed a method to resist it. And we also saw that, you know, we, we countered the number of tetramina over time. So what happens is the VNS is here. This is the blank media without any bacteria. So if you are growing this uh, cells, the tetramina, without any bacteria, it will not grow because it is not eating anything. But then if you feed them with bacteria, all these things, so the, the numbers will grow up because it is feeding the bacteria, so it will divide and grow. And we also saw that in NV1, uh, that it is not growing when compared to the blank. So which means it is not able to eat the organism and the organism is also not yet reduced. So it is getting killed or it is not able to grow, right? So we went on to understand what is actually happening here. What is the mode of action? So we, what we did was we actually took the bacteria, grew them and then filtered the bacteria out so we thought like if there is anything extracellular it is secreting, it might be killing this, uh, uh, the, the amoeba, right? So we took that supernatant, the extracellular stuff, and then we treated it with this uh, organism. What we saw was, you know, over time, you can see that there is a little bit bulge here and then the cells are being destroyed. So we, we, we got the uh, result here that uh, the egg, there is something, the bacteria is secreting extracellularly, which is actually killing the cells. Right? So it is the toxic factor that is excreted out of it. So then we took the uh, supernatant, which is the extracellular stuff. And then we tried to do a lot of different treatments with like, you know, if it is an enzyme or a protein, then this enzyme protein SK will destroy them. And we also did a size-based filtration, uh, heat it up, thaw it up and all that. So when we did all this, if it is a protein-based, then it will lose its activity basically. So when we saw that, uh, nothing actually uh, uh, you know, made a difference, right? So I'm going to move this so you can see this. So, so that is like everything is dead, which means all these treatment did not made a difference, right? And what we also saw was that <clears throat> the pH of the, the extracellular uh, secreted medium is actually four, which is very acidic. So we thought, okay, let's try to acid, uh, I mean, neutralize the pH. So we added sodium hydroxide, and then we saw that it was able to recover uh, the um, the killing. I mean, the, 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 so when you add sodium hydroxide, then the bacteria uh, uh, is unable to kill. And so it is kind of a pH dependent thing. So then what we thought was, okay, if it is pH, we just added some uh, HCl into the media and treated these cells uh, where the pH went up to like three, right? This is four, this is three, but even this was not killing. So HCl alone cannot kill, which means it is not only pH that is affecting, it is something, uh, something that is in the medium that is sensitive to pH is affecting the cells, right? So that's the next clue for us. So um, based on all these experiments, what we concluded that it is a small molecule because filtration doesn't help. 
so it is actually filtering through, which is which should be small, and then it is pH sensitive. So one of the things that we know that are pH sensitive, uh, which are also small molecules of weak organic acids. So they have this uh, carboxyl group at the end where the hydrogen, like when it is removed, it becomes, uh, when, when, it, when the hydrogen is present, which is protonated in its protonated form, uh, it is active. And then uh, when it is removed, it is not active. And this is actually based on pH. Like at, and at, uh, under acidic conditions, they're going to be protonated, which means hydrogen is going to be present. Uh, then it has become active. And then in alkaline stage, uh, where the pH is like more than seven, eight, then it is basic and they are not able because the, the hydrogen ion dissociate with this and then it cannot be functional. So what we thought was that, okay, and, and so when the pH is equal to pKa, which means 50% of the uh, molecule is protonated and 50% of them are in unprotonated form. So this is what happens. And, and when, so this is a general, uh, you know, background knowledge that we know. So what happens is organic acids has been shown that, you know, they can, because of their, uh, when they are deprotonated, what happens is uh, they cannot enter the cell, but when they are protonated, they can enter the cell wall generally, right? So when they go into the cell, the pH of this inside the cell is different, right? So they actually deprotonate, which means hydrogen ion is out and then this carboxyl uh, is uh, is also present. So when you have more and more hydrogen ion present, what happens? The pH of this internal cell, cell's internal pH goes down and that can actually affect the cellular um, functions and also cell walls so that it can, uh, you know, it can actually leak the cytoplasm and die. So we suspected that this is what is actually happening with this organism. So we quantified, we started with short chain fatty acids, like, you know, carbon number two to like carbon number five. And then when we measured them, we found that this organism, this bacteria produces a lot of acetate, acetic acid, basically. So what we did was we also know that the pKa of acetic acid is 4.6, which means at less than 4.6, more than 50 percentage of the compound more than 50 percentage of the concentration is dominated by the hydrogen ion containing protonated form so which can be really dangerous for the cells right so what we did was we tried to uh, we, we we know this experiment right so we added hcl up to 3 ph nothing happened and then what we did was we added acetic acid and then the ph approach to four then we saw that it is actually killing right so here the one star is dead killing and four stars are alive right so and what we did was when we so you see that one millimolar and two millimolar acetic didn't kill because the ph is not that way what we did was we actually added hcl to the acetic acid one millimolar acetic acid so the ph is again four now the we see that it is killing so it is clear that it is acetic acid it actually it's killing so when the, we went into understanding like you know what is actually happening how it is producing acetic acid generally acid excretion happens by two different pathways which is the PFL and the PUXP pathway. You don't have to remember all that. It's just, a, you know, this is how people approach and, you know, study uh, different things. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to explain this to you. So there are two pathways, basically. One is a direct uh, oxidation of pyruvate, um, and then it goes into acetate. The other one is it actually uh, converted into acetyl-CoA, and then the acetyl-CoA, usually it goes into TCA cycle, but then it is actually sometimes under anaerobic addition, especially it goes through this acetate kinase pathway where it then it is produced as acetate, right? What we know is that this is also energy uh, generating process. So during this acetate creation, it can actually generate ATP. So that's why under anaerobic condition, this is also preferred by the back, by generally cells. Like even in our case, like, you know, cancer cells do this, do this particular thing. Right, so it actually converts acetyl-CoA to acetate, thereby generating acid, uh, ATP energy. That's how they grow really fast. So we know that this organism, the bacteria, does not have the PUXP. So it is, it has to actually go through this pathway. But then what we also know is that generally, when pyruvate is converted into acetyl-CoA, it goes into TCA, where it is producing a lot of energy. The TCA works under aerobic condition, right? So we breathe and we have TCA. And that's how we have energy and that's how we are functioning. So this is how it happens. And only if the TCA is somehow arrested, then the cells will, okay, we cannot do TCA. We need the energy anyway. So we have to do this. So to, 
electric generate atp or under anaerobic condition it can happen so we wanted but all our experiments are under aerobic condition so we are supplying a lot of air to the bacteria and also uh, yeah so we are applying a lot of air to the bacteria so it is supposed to do this tca not the acetate and the fact that we are producing, we are getting more acetate in the environment is that somehow this is not actually active and this is happening. And uh, generally, RK is a gene that actually regulates the uh, aerobic anaerobic pathways. And this is actually produced when there is no oxygen so that it will block the TCA so that the carbon can go through this pathway. Uh, that those are uh, known actually. So when we are doing this, meanwhile, in Sydney, what they also found out was that uh, iron is an important factor for the uh, bacteria to resist uh, the uh, predation. So what they did was when they added a, a compound that it can actually kill it to iron, which means the iron is not available to the bacteria, then it is able to recover. Um, you know, th then actually it is able to, uh, the, the, the protozoa is able to eat the organism when there is less iron. And when you supplement more iron again, then it actually doesn't happen. So which means, this bacteria need iron to produce acetate. So we knew this uh, uh, information. And then what we did was we went for RNA sequencing. So we treated the bacteria with iron and we grew the bacteria without iron. And then we took the RNA, sorry, RNA from the cells. And then we sequenced them to find out like what is actually, what are the genes that are expressed. And what we found was that there is a lot of long list of genes. You don't have to you know remember anything, any of this. Uh, one thing, uh, we got from all this is that the central carbon metabolism genes were up and down regulated. So where the glycolysis were from glucose to pyruvate, all these are activated. So which means pyruvate is producing. And then we saw that the PFL is activated where it can produce acetate. And then we also saw the RK gene is activated. So which means it is actually stopping the R uh, TCA from happening. And that's why we know that, that it is producing acetate and it, we also know that these are also other genes that are actually expressed, uh, which is actually able to convert ethanol, formate, and CO2. So this formate ethanol acetate, so this is typically uh, uh, a characteristic of a fermentative anaerobic fermentation uh, life cycle, right? So we were not very sure why it, this is happening because you know we are supplying um, uh, you know, we are supplying oxygen and this is actually not actually going into TCA. And uh, we understood that the cells, is, uh, cells are actually producing energy because of this. And then what happens is you, you also need NAD uh, because NAD is converted into NADH during this uh, glycolysis. So if you have to have a steady flow of energy, you need NAD to replenish this one. And that is why, that is where it is used because when you are producing ethanol and format, NADH is actually converted to NAD and that NAD can go into glycolysis. So this cycle is what is actually happening in this organism, right? Anyway, so we were wondering like, you know, why is actually, why this is actually happening? What is it, uh, why the RK uh, is actually expressed? So we deleted the RK from this organism and then we saw that, you know, how they are growing. The growth was a little bit less and then what we found was that it becomes sensitive, which means when you don't have RK, then the cells are able to, the, the uh, protozoa is able to eat the bacteria, right? So it is very clear. And we also saw that the, the, the protozoa numbers went up because it is able to eat the bacteria. So we know now the RK is really important and the cells are relying on acetate metabolism so much. Uh, there is something called acetate switch. What happens is even some organisms like uh, E. coli and uh, Vibrio, when they have a lot of sugar outside, they do do this acetate excretion for some time. And, uh, and then what happens is when once the acetate starts coming down, then it, it switches to acetate assimilation. So this is called acetate switch. So initially it grows and then it produces uh, acetate and then the dotted lines are acetate here, right? So it produces acetate and as a, at some point when the glucose concentration is less, here, this is the glucose concentration, it's less, and then it starts consuming the acetate, right? So this is called a acetate switch. So we know that this is actually happening. Uh, so what we did was we took two different 
it's the same organism same species but two different uh, uh, strains env1 is the strain that we are working with at the moment and the l180 is another strain that we know that it can be eaten by the protozoa so we compared these two about growth and the ph and also how much acetate they are producing right so when we did this we saw that the growth the growth um, pattern is very different so the boxes right here this is actually the l180 and this is how usually bacteria grow it's an s kind of curve but then env1 did not grow like that so it it, it produced a lot of cells initially and then it flattened out when you see the ph you can see that the l180 the ph is like you know almost like neutral or towards the alkaline but then env1 it is actually producing a lot of acids so it is actually the ph went down immediately to 4 and then it's maintained there so then we checked the acetate and you can see that the acetate produced by the l180 is produced for some time and then it being consumed but here in the env1 it it keeps on producing this so we know now that you know it the, the acetate switches off for this organism right so in conclusion so we saw that there is this one that uh, the the env1 is an organism that can kill pyriformis from an extracellular factor and then we found that it is basically doing acetate excretion and the reason why it is doing acetate excretion is that it lost its acetate switch right so this is an adaptation this organism has happened and why it is important to understand this why why this um, what is it to do with the pathogenesis so this metabolism that i showed right is called also called overflow metabolism so it also happens in us like cancer metabol cancer metabolism is mainly overflow metabolism and in vibrio cholerae the cholera producing uh, organism this particular overflow metabolism is actually activating this toxi tox t which is the cholera toxin that actually makes us you know go diarrhea and all that so this tox t expression is associated with this overflow metabolism exactly the same thing happens as you can see acetyl coa it usually has to go to tca but then tca is absent uh, and then you get uh, you get to express tox t and then the cholera toxin comes in right acetate is also produced during this so given the fact this is an environmental isolate and it has this ability to do anaerobic respiration even though in the under under aerobic conditions it is a potential threat right so that is why we have to monitor these and then uh, we, we we are actually you know working on uh, in a project also uh, to try to write a project to uh, do uh, uh, environmental monitoring to understand if this kind of metabolism is happening uh, in other organisms or not so that we are very sure or we we can we can we can we can prevent early infections and so on right so i just want to leave you with this again uh, you know this the 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 arms race that is going on between prey and predators in a different system that can actually affect the humans and animals because they can develop new strains that it can um, you know infect us a very good example is covid right sars cov2 it was in a bat so there was an interaction going between bat and the bacteria uh, and the virus and then it happened to develop uh, uh, the spike uh, protein that can infect human uh, cells and uh, now we have the delta variant and the omni variant where you can see these are the mutations in the delta variant from the original sars cov2 which actually made it to infect even better and then delta variant actually costed a lot of lives in india of course we know that and then the new omni variant you can see the blue and red ones right the blue ones are the deletion point deletion mutation so it has more mutations that's why we are worried at the moment uh, so i'm i'm recording this on 6th of december now so at the moment we know that these are mutations but we don't know exactly like what is it going to be more pathogenic or something right we definitely know it is more transmissible transmissible at this point so this is how things evolve so that's why we need a survival system environmental monitoring system so we don't have to only think about humans we have to think about other organisms and animals and plants and everything that is in the system uh, as a, as a, as a one health perspective and be able to monitor everything to protect ourselves so is this the end for the pandemic no it's not right it's more to come because this arms race is going on on and on right it is actually happening everywhere so we need to be vigilant and that's why we need to do uh, environmental monitoring research right so with this uh, i would like to acknowledge uh, you know our collaborator mr uh, dian mcgregor from sydney 
and uh, our uh, our group's bi is scott rice and these two are the people clarence was in celsi in uh, he is still in celsi in singapore he was doing most of the lab work here and parisa was doing it's also a part of her phd thesis in uh, in sydney and this is uh, professor scott's lab uh, so thanks to everyone um, and uh, thanks for listening and if you have more questions and so on you can contact me, drop me an email or something, or you can visit my website, drpeter.wordpress.com, and uh, I, would, uh, I would be happy to answer your questions, right? So I will close it here. Thank you. I hope uh, you enjoyed this uh, session. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.